Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Wheelchair Activist. This is a podcast hosted by me, Emma Vogelman, where I get to interview some pretty amazing disabled people. But today, we're actually not going to be talking to a disabled person, but we're going to be interviewing our first ally of disabled people. I'm interviewing my childhood best friend, Lainey Burke. She is a child life specialist in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm going to be talking to her about what it was like growing up with a disabled best friend. Just as a bit of a warning, this episode talks a lot about hospitalization and the way that Lainey and I have both dealt with the trauma of being in hospital as young teenagers. I'm so excited to hop into today's episode and I really hope you are too. I was just talking about this with a coworker the other day. We all had the same, if we all had the same belief system or all the same, you know, looks are about us, we'd be so boring. As far as like, you know, getting you dressed for gym or, you know, putting your coat on before recess, it was just, it wasn't even like a conscious thought of like, this is what I have to do because Emma can't do it. This was more of the, well, I need to help Emma out in order for her so we can hang out or we can play or I can pretend that I'm running next to next to her. Growing up and especially after you moved, I didn't really, I felt like a lot of, this sounds like heavy, but I thought that a lot of my identity was lost because my, a lot of my identity was with you. And I think that very similar to Lee, how um, our group of friends kind of stopped, you know, stopped their relationship because they didn't know how to deal with, you know, what had happened to you. It also happened to me as well, where people just couldn't relate to what had happened. Amazing. Well, Lainey, thank you so much for joining us on the Wheelchair Act Fist and for being the first disabled ally, or sorry, the ally of the disabled community. You are not yourself disabled. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I am so, so, so excited to be here. Can you tell our wonderful audience a little bit about you, who you are, and what you do? Mm-hmm. So my name is Lainey. I am a 28-year-old woman living in Chicago, Illinois, and I met the founder of the wheelchair activist, Emma Vogelman, in our kindergarten class back in 1999, and um, currently am a certified child life specialist, and what that entails is um, making the experience for pediatric patients and families in the hospital um, less scary, reduce anxiety and promote positive coping and play while they're there. And that's what I do here. I also really like to be outside. I like to cook and I, um, am really right now into the everything bagel seasoning. I don't know if you guys have it there in the UK, but it's my new favorite thing. We probably do, but it's probably not the most accurate, (laughs) but I, I will have a look in the grocery store next time um when you said that we met in 99 i immediately thought dude don't tell them how old we are Um, well you know what let's be proud of it because i can (laughs) i still think of myself as 22 permanently even though obviously um always permanently 22 years old i mean i like to think that you and i don't look 28 um so uh, we can definitely get away with it as long as i think yeah, I think as long as we can still do everything that we need to do, we'll just say how we're 22. Um, there we go. And I should also say that you are our first international guest. Um, Ooh, so honored. Super exciting. Um, super, super exciting. So, yeah, you and I met when we were five years old. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason that I was so keen to have you on this podcast was because like I was saying that there are so many spaces well I say so many there are some spaces for parents of disabled people or siblings of disabled people to talk about their experience um but I don't know of that many official channels for friends of disabled people and what I think would be really interesting to get your take on is like you know I've spoken on this podcast before about 
when I was growing up, I didn't consider myself to be disabled. And like a lot of that is because obviously the US is really accessible because it's a lot newer of a country than the UK. So, I mean, there was Mm -hmm. really nothing I was prevented from doing growing up. Um, But, you know, you were my best friend from five years old. Mm -hmm. And it would be so interesting to hear about like, how did disability play a role in your childhood? Like, was it something that was on your radar? Like, did you think like, oh, this is Emma, she's my disabled friend? Like, what was that like? Um, so I'm going to circle back to the first day that we met, which was the first day of kindergarten. And the things that I remember was that Miss Weiss, who was our teacher at the time, introduced you. You were wearing this. She was evil, by the way, but she loved you. I liked her, but she loved us too. <laughs> Carry on. Um, anyway, she introduced you. And the one thing that she said, this is Emma, this is her chair and nobody touches it. And that's all I remember. And I don't remember what the connection was or what the fascination was, but I was like, I want to be that girl's friend. And from there on out, it was just that it was Emma and Lainey all the time. And I never really noticed that there was a disability because everything I did, you were able to do and we were able to modify it in whatever way. Mm. For example, I remember the first time you came over to my house for a play date for the first time. And I think it was also your first play date outside of your house. Yeah, probably. And, And I don't, my mom told me about this a couple of days ago, but obviously we don't remember about how much coordination that your, my mom and your parents had to do in order to get you up the stairs into my bedroom. Cause all I wanted you to see was my lime green bedroom and my orange table. So we could have a tea party, but <laughs> as little kids, I think that especially your parents did a really, really great job in making sure that you were able to do all those types of things. So mm-hmm. being disabled, I never really saw it that way because from then on out, we were always able to make it happen. You were always a part of sleepovers. You were always a part of birthday parties, everything. And even like going to the mall, we would just take your car, they would drop us off. And then we call them when we were ready to pick up or movie theater or things like that. So I think that too, particularly the elementary school that we went to, since it was the only wheelchair accessible school in the district that also really, um, made it just this disabilities weren't a part of it, it. It wasn't like that we were blind to them, but it wasn't anything important or something that we had to like mm. really focus on because it was just every, it was all over and it was, there was so much awareness around it and people and kids integrated into classrooms. So it, it never really affected me um, in those ways when we were younger. Yeah. And that's something that like, I've tried to speak to a little bit on this podcast, Um, but like in the UK, in my limited experience with the education system, I've noticed that, you know, disability is very much segregated. And I sort of try and explain to people what our situation was growing up. So, you know, obviously you and I were in the same classes and everything are entire childhood but there are so many other types of disabled kids who Mm -hmm. were in our school who like you said were in our classes and you know they'd sit in on a class and listen to the teacher explain something but then they'd go off and do Mm -hmm. a different assignment to us and I think that that's such an interesting experience and something that I really hope that the UK like continues Mm -hmm. to evolve and bring into practice because I I completely hear what you're saying like it was it was just normal Mm -hmm. from a super young age for us to see people with down syndrome or you know whatever other conditions that there were so we sort of don't I don't know would you say that when you meet disabled people now like as an adult how how is that for you, given your super integrated experience as a kid? Um, like I said, I think now that I'm older and I'm the, and I'm able to live a more independent life, I think I can notice the differences a little bit, but at the same time, it doesn't make me feel and feel any different about that person. 
um, you know, before I was a child life specialist, I worked with kids on the autism spectrum and obviously those difference, some of those differences looked very, very different between each child. But at the same time, our goal was always to get them to some sort of independence where they could lead a really fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. And I think that being this integrated too of everyone just kind of, you know, living in this world, it's not only benefiting, you know, somebody who is disabled or whatever and yeah. whatever in whatever type of capacity where they're able to integrate with the rest of society but it's also really important for kids who are not disabled and yeah. ch- and um people who and adults because it makes you learn patience and value also the things that you are able to do and then how are you able to impact that person in a different way and i'm not necessarily saying that they have to become best friends, although that really helped me in my favor. But yeah. at the same time, what are you going to do to make this world more accessible and inclusive to others, whether that's somebody who's disabled or somebody who doesn't look like you or somebody who doesn't practice the same beliefs or anything like that. So mm-hmm. I was just talking about this with a coworker the other day. If we all had the same, if we all had the same belief system or all same, you know, looks are about us, we'd be so boring. Yeah, absolutely. I I couldn't agree yeah. more. I think like, you know, one thing that I love to talk about, whether it's professionally or, you know, on the podcast, whatever it is, is that diversity should be really celebrated. You know, the mm-hmm. differences should be acknowledged and celebrated because people will be, you know, they'll have different skills depending on their background you know like you just said you learned patience and you know compassion and all of those things from your experience so let's not treat everyone Mm -hmm. exactly the same because we're not and those differences Mm -hmm. should be celebrated and I think another thing that I wanted to ask you about is so growing up and this is probably something that the UK the UK is not going to fully understand um but so you and I grew up in Illinois, and I don't think it's the same in every state, but we had gym or PE every day. Mm-hmm. And yeah. when we were what about 10, 12, like around that age, we started having to change into our gym uniforms, um, yeah. you know, for that class. And you were the friend who <laughs> helped me change for my gym uniform every day and just Mm -hmm. the thing about our friendship is that you know yeah we were friends and like we did everything together but and this is you know pre me being on a ventilator and everything but you were essentially like a carer like a PA you Mm -hmm. know to me growing up and it was just like a default what we like that's what we did and Mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of ask you like was that ever a conscious decision that you made or is it just something that happened like how did how did that go for you um I don't know I I think that you know it was helping a friend out but just in a different way so you know if I, it wouldn't be, it wasn't any different to me between like helping somebody with their math homework or, you know, helping you get your gym shirt on, which at the time we always thought was so stupid because it was like, what were you doing? But at this, but really, if you think about it now, it was another way of you being included in a normal school experience. And part of that normal school experience was getting dressed for gym Yeah, and, you know, being in that girl's locker room, which we always hated, but at the same time, you're able to get that experience and you weren't not included. You were always included in everything. So as far as like, you know, getting you dressed for gym or, you know, putting your coat on before recess, it was just, it wasn't even like a conscious thought of like, this is what I have to do because Emma can't do it. This was Mm -hmm. more of the, well, I need to help Emma out in order for her so we can hang out or we can play, or I can pretend that I'm running next to next to her even though I'm supposed yeah. to be running really fast. And even though it was just like a really quick walk. So um, no, it wasn't anything. I never even thought about it like that before because those, those little acts that I did back then was, it was, it was just part of my nature and just an automatic of like, this is just me helping my other friend out. 
versus anything else. It wasn't, no one ever told me to do it. Yeah. And I um, speak when you, you know, there are a couple of things I want to pick up on there, but do you remember when we did volleyball um, and when it became pretty dang obvious that it probably wasn't the safest for me to be like on the volleyball court. So I sat in this little like alcove taking score and they still wanted me to change. I don't know if you remember this, but some, mm-hmm. I can't remember which gym teacher it was, but they threatened to send me to the principal's office because we were like, this is ridiculous. Why am I changing to keep oh score? God. And, you know, being sassy, Emma, I said something like, well, I'm not going to change clothes for math class. Like, I'm essentially just counting. And they That's threatened terrible. to send me to the principal's office. And I thought, fine, do it. See if I care. Oh my gosh. No, I don't remember that, but I feel like that is definitely something that we would have said, or you would have said for sure. Oh, for for sure. sure. Yeah. Um, They never did. but I, I just thought I'm going to call their bluff, see if they do it. Um, And there's this (laughs) other distinct memory that I have and I absolutely love. Um, And I mention it a lot when I talk about you is, you know, you mentioned about running. So for (laughs) For um, people in the UK, um, so we, I think it was every Wednesday, we mm-hmm. had to like run laps around the gym and you would have to tell the gym teacher how many laps you had done in the class. And it was always just sort of accepted that you were going to go at my pace with me and we would just lie about how many laps you did <laughs> because... It sounds so stupid, but you had to do a certain number of laps. Like, obviously, for me, it didn't like matter hugely, but for you to like pass gym, you had to do a certain number of laps. You would always lie and just tell them the minimum number of laps you needed to do. Um, Always. But no one, no one ever questioned it because you were always just with me. And there is this distinct memory that. I have it was a it was an outdoor walkathon that we oh would do. I remember this yeah I um there was this big like field outside our school it was like a football field um and by that I mean American football um <laughs> and one of our teachers was on a megaphone and I think it was for charity and it was and the teacher shouted on the megaphone like oh there's gonna be a prize for the best walker and he just so blasely turned to me and went well I think we can count you out of that <laughs> and I just love that because everyone else would think god what a bitch or yeah. know, how, how awful but it was so funny and it was so just I think it just perfectly illustrates yeah. how you know how close to me where first of all I just thought mm-hmm. that that was so funny but also how comfortable we were I guess I'm talking about like you know the fact that I couldn't walk and it just it didn't matter but it was just like it's I think Mm -hmm. it just really speaks to how normalized disability became for not just you but for like so many of the other kids that we grew up with um Mm -hmm. but do, do you remember that I absolutely remember it. I wrote it in my college essay. Did you actually? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I oh, wrote wow. that memory. I remember that very vividly. And I think going back to your point about normalizing um, disabilities, I think that as you and I got older and then the experiences that we had, especially when you got really sick, we were able to talk about it more openly before, you know, mm-hmm. which is very appropriate for how we were, you know, like cognitive development, which is where my um, professional brain goes. But um, it is interesting to see how the way we started where we didn't talk about it because we didn't know anything better. And then as we grew up where, you know, some slight differences became, were brought to the surface, but at the same time, we were okay with talking about what those differences were. And it wasn't going to be a threatening or a demeaning type of conversation because again, celebrating diversity and celebrating people's differences and their abilities, I think 
makes this makes our society, but also makes your close circle yeah. more interesting and being able to um, realize what those differences are in a pot and bring it to a positive way. I, I did not know that you put that in your college essay, but I kind of love that. And I really I hope that some admissions person laughed. At well, that. I got into college, so maybe yeah. they did. But <laughs> I want to go back to what you were saying about like with your professional hat on about cognitive mm-hmm. development, but like how, how does disability and like the openness in which we were able to talk about it play a role in that? Um, in my professional world, you mean? Yeah, like how, you know, how, yeah, what, what impact does our, our, our childhood uh, have on the way that, yes. you know, you approach things now professionally? Yes. So, but um, hang on, before we do that, I just what can you tell our audience a little bit about what a child life specialist is? Because we sort of have them in the UK, but for mm-hmm. anyone who doesn't know what that is, what is that? Yes. Yeah, so a child life specialist is um, a certified is is a certification, and we our background is in child development and family services. And what we primarily do is support pediatric patients and their families in the hospital setting to reduce stress and anxiety, and then also normalize the hospital. And a lot of the times what I say in, you know, colloquial terms is like, make sure that kids are still staying kids when they're um, getting their medical treatment. So for example, I, um, I, the other day was helping a patient get an IV for the first time. And she has a lot of, you know, medical trauma. And, you know, what I did was taught her everything that she's going to see in a developmentally appropriate way possible things that she's going to feel. And then how are we going to cope with that situation? Because obviously nobody likes to get poked and prodded. And I know you don't especially, but what are we going to do to make this experience the best that we possibly can? So for the next time that she has to get some sort of medical intervention, it's not as scary as a thing. Um, And then for kids who are long-term patients or kids who come to the hospital often for treatments, what are we going to do? What types of activities are we going to make sure that their developmental milestones are still being hit. So those really, really young kids, those babies, those toddlers. And then, you know, as we move up into school age and teens, what are we going to do to make sure that they're processing their emotions appropriately? And as well as getting the socialization and the interaction that they would outside of the hospital. Mm. That's in a nutshell. We also wear a bunch of different hats and things like that. And I won't go into it fully, but there's a couple of parts of my job that I really, really love. One is being able to empower kids with information and not, and telling them the truth in an appropriate way. Mm. So again, that they're less scared and not as fearful and they know exactly what to expect. And there's definitely been some times in my professional career where that light bulb hits and they're like, Oh, I know exactly what I need to do now in order to get through this really painful situation. And then another thing that, you know, really ties into our relationship and how I got into this field is how we are making sure that kids are still staying kids when they're in the hospital, especially when they're in there for a long time. Mm. Um, And the reason I say that that kind of divided from our relationship was when you were very ill and I would come to Children's Memorial in Chicago at least two to three times a week. We wouldn't talk about medicine. We wouldn't talk about anything that's happening. But what my goal was every time was to make sure that I was bringing what we would do at your house or at the mall or whatever to your hospital room. So Mm -hmm. we made jewelry once we watched Gilmore Girls once we would just talk, you know, shit about, you know, gossiping about us and like friends and stuff like we normally would. And, you know, I thought that there wasn't it was a really helpless feeling at the time, um, going through that experience. But I knew that if this is what I could contribute to make sure that Emma was still staying Emma in this type of situation, that's exactly what I was going to do. So that's how, um, my, how I kind of found, Mm. and I didn't, I don't remember if you ever had a child life specialist when you were in the hospital, but from those memories and that experience and me researching, you know, different career paths, Mm -hmm. it all just kind of clicked together. It's, it's really interesting how like our experience of 
being in the hospital like informed that but I I did when um I was sort of coming towards the end of my three month hospital stay with swine flu um I did work with a child life specialist and they mm. I think they came and spoke to some of my classes um in our second year of high school to like mm-hmm. sort of describe like yeah. want to talk to classmates about me and like you know this is what it means if Emma goes out of the room like she's okay you know this is what's mm-hmm. going on um but one thing I so vividly remember is them asking me about my friends and sort of how did I think that my friends were going to deal with it and I think one thing that's important for our audience to know is that you and I went to the same school from age five to 14 and Mm -hmm. you know we were part of a group of friends you know and we we grew up together we all like generally lived within a few blocks of each other um so we were all really close like you and I obviously were extremely close but I so vividly remember telling the child life specialist that I was not concerned at all about how my friends were going to deal with things when I got discharged from hospital because I had so much faith in everyone and that got proved wrong as you know you know a lot of the people that we grew up with I don't know if it was because they couldn't deal with it emotionally or they didn't know how to deal with it or continue to relate to me but a lot of our friends stopped talking to me that second year of high school and you didn't um you know you were like as I don't know if the kids say this but like, you were the ultimate ride or die like mm. you know you never once made me feel awkward or you know anything because like you said when we were in that hospital room yeah, lots of other shit was going on that was really heavy and really difficult for us both to deal with, but it was just us hanging out. And then when I came out of hospital, you still came over every Friday and we'd have movie night and my mom would bring home Chinese food. And, you know, so it was always completely normal between us. But, you know, that must have had... You know, and now clearly it did, but it must have had a huge impact on you, like, you know, without getting, like, too heavy. But how was that experience? Like, you mentioned that it felt really hopeless. And to me, like, that 100% never came across to me. Like, obviously, I knew it was really difficult for all of us to deal with, but you never, you never gave me any indication that that was you know you know what I mean I knew it was difficult you never showed me that and it was yeah yeah. it was really it was really difficult because I knew I had a feeling that from that moment on that the things that we used to do were going to look a little different and they did Mm -hmm. and our um and I would say that even though you were in a wheelchair I would say you pretty you pretty much lived a pretty independent life yeah and a lot of our independence you and I together as a whole, um, was removed a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I remember specifically you had the really, this really, really sweet home nurse who was just trying to do her job and making sure that you were okay and you were staying safe. But, you know, we were used to just like hanging out in the living room or walking around Lincolnwood Avenue without yeah. an adult there. And she had to go everywhere you went and you were so, so annoyed. And I remember Sounds that day. Right. Yeah. And I remember that day and I just was like, this isn't this, our relationship is going to look different now. Um, Something that a lot of um, my coworkers and I talk about and other child life specialists is that we're really able to compartmentalize our feelings and our emotions when we're working with patients and families. And I Mm -hmm. think that I learned that at a very early age um, with you in the sense that I you were dealing with too much and how is I going to, you know, bring any of my emotions onto you? Um, so I really hyper-focused on my one task and that was my one job. And that was to make sure that you were, you were staying, you were staying emotionally safe and you were okay. And that 
I wasn't bringing on any extra emotions or anything like that. So I think that was always like my intel. And I just, um, when I growing up and especially after you moved, I didn't really, I felt like a lot of, it sounds like heavy, but I thought that a lot of my identity was lost because my, a lot of my identity was with you. Yeah. And I think that very similar to Lee, how um, our group of friends kind of stopped, you know, stopped their relationship because they didn't know how to deal with, you know, what had happened to you. It also happened to me as well, where mm. people just couldn't relate to what had happened and um, they couldn't relate to me anymore. And the things that they wanted to do, I didn't really want to. And it just, it was really, it was really, really challenging. Um, because I think the experiences that you and I had were so beyond anybody and something that nobody, I don't wish upon anybody, but also that not many people experience. So, uh, it, I mean, it definitely had a really great impact on me. However, I was able to learn about how, and this is something that I'm still working on as an adult, how to, you know, bring my needs that I have who, that are also important as well as the people that I care about. So I think that growing up, um, in order for me to not deal with my emotions, I dealt with yours instead because it always made me feel better, but, um, cause I was doing something about it, but now as an adult figuring out that, okay, these need my needs have to be met first before yeah. I can help anybody else. And I think that that's an incredibly important lesson for everyone to learn and, like particularly people who work in healthcare, you know, like you do, but because your job, it's not just, okay, we'll give them this drug, see how their numbers are and then check back, you know, like a doctor or a nurse, but because your job is so emotion driven, it's, you know, it's so taxing. I can imagine, and you do need to show up for yourself first. And I think it's, you know, I sort of feel like, how did I get to today, like in this conversation, not realizing that you did that for me? And it makes me feel bad. And, you know, but, but, it, but here's the thing, Emma, and it shouldn't make you feel bad because that's exactly what I needed at the time. And yeah. that's how I, that's how, that was what was, you know, filling up my cup every day in the sense that like I was doing something because I couldn't. I didn't have the emotional intelligence to sit with, to sit with the emotions at the time. And, you know, I say to all of these patients and their families crying is whatever the way you cope is where is how you cope. And that was the way I was coping at the time was being helpful to somebody else because I couldn't cope with the emotions that I was actually having. And I think this is going a little bit off tangent, but um, you know, mental health then 2009 was not where it is now. And the, um, and it still isn't amazing and the awareness that we have, but it's so much better. And, you know, when this was all going down, there was no counselor. There was no somebody talking about talking to us about, you know, how to deal with these types of emotions and how to deal with these really, really big life experiences that you shouldn't face ever, let alone at 14. Yeah. So I think that, um, it was, this is, that was the only way I knew how to deal with it. So it really was it wasn't, you were never a burden. It was never, I never felt like that at all. It was more of like, this is how I can help myself Mm. in order to get through this time. And I think it's really interesting that, and, you know, like you said, you and I as a whole, but like, you know, people talk about, you know, their partners as the other half and stuff, but growing up, you know, we were each other's other half. Like we were all, you know, you and I were a package deal um Mm -hmm. you know and it wasn't just because you were you know the incredibly kind kid that you were and helped me out and stuff it was just like we we completely we needed each other and Mm -hmm. you know I think our our friendship was so special in that way that you know I think we both gave each other exactly what we needed growing up um but it's it is really interesting, you know, I think it's, you know, you said about the nurse and I think, you know, people look at me now, you know, with the event and all of that stuff that I didn't 
have when we were younger. So, you know, people struggle to think, well, how did you just like go to the mall or go to the park or whatever with a bunch of other 13 year olds? And it was, you know, trying to say, no, no, but you know, they, but like particularly you always made sure I was okay, but it was so automatic. It -hmm. was never, you know, oh, someone make sure you hold the door open for Emma. It was just, you know, someone just automatically did that. Um, And same, you know, with what we were talking about with the gym uniform, Mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, we need to create, because the thing I can imagine is like, oh, let's create a schedule for what other student is going to help Emma or what teacher's assistant is going to help Emma. And I think it's important to say it um, at this point for anyone who's thinking like, well, why wasn't a teacher's assistant doing it? Well, my teaching assistant growing up was male. So he obviously mm-hmm. wasn't going to be in the 13-year-old girl's locker room. Um, so yeah. it, but I don't remember us ever discussing like that you were going to do this, you were going to do that. It was just, just natural for us. It was, it was super natural. It was super normal. And I think, like I said earlier, it was because um, this is how my friend, my other half at the time was going to be able to be included in these activities. And I didn't want to do them with anybody else. So if that's what I had to do, that's what I was going to do. You also hated gym class. So I don't think we were no. like, oh, you weren't, oh man, I don't get to run 30 laps, darn. Did hate gym class for sure. Yeah, it sucked. It really sucked. In yeah. in the UK, they only do it like twice a week. Dang. It was I on know. my GPA. It was on my GPA in high school. That's so unfair. Um, but I think, you know, I want to talk about how, you know, our experience particularly for those three months in 2009 informed your career choice like you know we've said that was a really terrible time for us both so you know and you've spoken a lot about get I don't want to say giving back but you know how you can can how you felt like you could contribute to keeping me okay but Mm -hmm. what made you think I want to do that professionally? Uh, well, so we had all that happened to us at 14, 15. And then, you know, as trauma does, you block it out of your mind and you yep. like remember things here and there, but not really. And I was a senior in college and you know, throughout college, I always kind of knew that I wanted to work in medicine. I was mm-hmm. that weirdo kid who threw their dolls down the stairs, constantly playing doctor. You know, my favorite show is ER and Grey's Anatomy and all this stuff. So I knew I wanted to work in medicine. I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor, all that kind of stuff. And I was Googling one day on how, what I could do with a bachelor's degree at the time. So that for people in the UK, that's your um, four-year degree for college. Mm -hmm. Um, And working in a hospital setting. And I happened to stumble upon this video of a child life specialist talking about what their career was and what they did. And all of these memories of me as a little kid, us in the hospital all came flooding back. I was like, that's it. And so from there on out, I, and it's a very pretty competitive field to get into shockingly Mm -hmm. enough. And I did a ton of research Um, I spoke to a couple of child life specialists, one at the hospital that you were treated at now that's Lurie children's hospital, but at the time was children's memorial. I spoke to them kind of what the path I needed to do in order to get this done and just started building the blocks from there. So right after college, I worked with kids on the autism spectrum and did some behavioral therapy with that. And then from there on out, went to pursue my master's degree in child development And then I did a bunch of volunteer hours at the hospital. And my mom said, can't those hours with Emma count? And I said, no. That would have Um, been so many hours. It would have been so many hours. Uh, I volunteered at a bunch of different hospitals. I nannied. I, you know, went to South Africa, worked in a hospital there. I worked at the Evanston Hospital, you know, learning as much as I could, getting as many experience hours as I could. 
And then in order to get certified, you have to complete a 600 hour internship. So I did that um, fall and winter of 2020. So completing it in a pandemic, which was a little crazy and fun times. Now am where I am now, which is, um, you know, providing support to patients and families in the hospital. But I, it was, it was one of those things. And it sounds so cheesy where I watched this video and I, it all, it was like the light bulb hit. And I was like, that's Mm -hmm. it. And ever since then, it was like a hyper, a hyper focus to get where I needed to go. And I never really diverted from that path because I knew that in order to get what I needed to do, this was, I had to do this, this, and this. So Mm -hmm. How do you, so what does your day-to-day look like in your job? What do you do? It always looks a little different every day. Um, so right now at the hospital that I'm currently working at, I um, provide a lot of procedural support and education to kids. So teaching them about what an IV is, teaching them, you know, what an MRI is, uh, and supporting them through those procedures. And especially when parents aren't able to be at the bedside or Mm -hmm. parents are serving a different role, again, making the experience that they have the less traumatic and the most, you know, beneficial as possible. So the next, so the next time they have to get a poke or an injection or an IV or another scan, it's not as scary. And they remember those experiences and they can apply those coping skills that we created for the next time, whether that's you know, watching a video on an iPad, taking deep breaths, watching the procedure itself, having explaining to them everything that they're possibly going to feel. So it isn't, it isn't a surprise. And again, empowering kids with information so they can also be a part of their medical experience and their medical journey. And it's not giving them more control because as you know, you lose a ton of control when you're in the hospital, you have no say in anything. And this is giving them their some independence, some autonomy, and some empowerment back. You know, just thinking about those three months that I spent in the hospital, I think, you know, I was really lucky in a way because obviously my mom is a doctor and I spent so much time in the hospital with various chest infections and pneumonia as a kid. So I came to those three months with a good amount of medical knowledge Mm -hmm. so like you know when the doctors would come and do rounds I always had them do their round in my hospital room so that Mm -hmm. I could hear what the plan was and I knew what was going on um but you know for so many kids like either that could be really scary having you know 10 doctors or eight doctors come into the room and I'll talk about numbers and you know all of that that could really scare people but for me it was no you're gonna do this so that I know and you're gonna ask me what I think because you know obviously what we were 15 or so at the time so I wasn't a small small child who couldn't really weigh in on decisions but I think you know I appreciate how lucky I was in that Mm -hmm. scenario to be able to be informed and it's I think it's incredible that you're doing this and you know whenever I remember telling my parents when you first told me that you were going to do that um and they just went oh she's going to be so good at that (laughs) because (laughs) of our our childhood and everything and how Mm -hmm. involved you were with all of my hospitalizations really you know particularly the spine flu one but every time I went in the hospital for anything else you knew um I knew and I uh, I think I had the children's memorial operator on speed dial because I would always yeah. play and you know it's ju- it just reminded me of this time you're probably going to slightly hate me for bringing this up but it just you know occurred to me because we were talking about how every you know things that you were experiencing you felt sort of came second to supporting me but I remember there was this time that I had been in hospital for maybe a week or so and um, I say the term boyfriend very loosely because we were maybe 13 but um, (laughs) your boyfriend 
broke up with you. It was Dylan. <laughs> it was Dylan Lito. Shout oh, out, Dylan, if you're listening to this. You probably aren't, <laughs> but you were the love of Lady's life. <laughs> That's my fucker, oh my God. Um, but he broke up with you that day. And I remember um, our friend Jesse, who I know you're still friends with, he was the one who told me that that it happened and that you were so upset. And I just remember trying to get hold of you thinking, you know, I knew how upset you were going to be and how, you know, I just immediately wanted to be there for you. But, you know, now thinking about it with the context of this conversation, it's it sort of has a different light to it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, for sure. I don't remember that, but um, I think- just as well. um, It just goes back to the relationship that we had and how normal it was. Mm -hmm. And that just because, you know, you were in the hospital dealing with your own medical crisis, if you will, Mm -hmm. you still wanted to be a supportive person to somebody that you really cared about. So again, it just goes, it goes back to kind of this whole theme that we're talking about of how Mm -hmm. it was just normal and it didn't really those types of factors that people think would um, halt a type of relationship or make it different weren't that way. But so going back to your career now, so obviously not every patient that you interact with has a disability, you know, Mm -hmm. but they are all kids or, you know, young people. And have you ever worked with a you know, a disabled patient and sort of, if you have, how did you approach that? Like, did you bring in your own experience? Do you, are you allowed to mention it, at, you know, at any um, point? Yeah, I actually did this recently. Um, For my own personal boundaries, I try not to, because I don't want to reflect, um, you know, my experiences and my personal relationships onto somebody else, because their experience could be completely different than what I had and what I saw with my own eyes as a teen. But I think I do in the moment, I don't really think about it as much as what those experiences were until I'm processing it later. So I have had a couple of patients who it was very eerily similar to what you and I experienced in high school. Um, And I didn't really realize it until after I had left that room and, um, with that, I think, again, goes back to the compartmentalizing that a lot of people in this field can do. And your number one job is to focus on that patient and that family alone. And you can't bring in, even though it's so normal to think about other things and think about your own experiences and try to connect, it's still really, really important to have that mindset of, you know, this is their experience and you don't want to foster in anything else and you don't want to bring in anybody else's experiences and put it back onto the patient and the family. Mm. Um, but you know, we do in this field, a lot of reflective supervision and just a lot of reflecting in general, because these emotions and these situations are so raw and you're just like, what the heck? Sometimes I had a couple friends over who work in this field and we were talking the other night and they were like, this job is so messed up sometimes. And it is. But, you know, at the end of the day, you are providing a service that one, they probably weren't expecting. And two, you're making this experience not better because I can't make it better. I'm trying to make it as positive as I can and be as supportive as I can. So Mm -hmm. um, I, and I guess, you know, in hindsight, that brings us back full circle of, you know, what I was doing for you at the time. But, um, I think, like I said, it's really important to make sure that that experience is individualized. And then, you know, once you leave that room, that's when you can reflect and say, okay, this was eerily similar to this thing that I had, or, you know, what I experienced with Emma back then and all those types of things. So I think maybe unconsciously I do, but, Mm -hmm. but I really, really tried to, um, for my own personal protection and then the protection of the patient and the family as well. Yeah, and I completely get that. You know, you have to have those boundaries in place. And, you know, it's something that my, you know, that my mom deals with from time to time. It's um, 
funny. Uh, oh, this was a while ago now, but there was a colleague of hers who said, you know, I had this patient come in. They had, you know, this very rare condition. I'd never heard of it before. It's spinal muscular atrophy. And they went, have you ever heard of it? And she went, actually, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, and then sort of like, you know, I briefly told them um, about me. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, I can imagine that, you know, it is difficult to separate. But what, you know, you said that there's a lot of reflective supervision. And are you given the support that you feel you need to deal with that? Or is, you know, we talked about mental health is a lot better mm-hmm. awareness wise than it was when we were kids. But is it there for you as, you know, a child life specialist? Yes. Um, there, you know, in some institutions, you have to seek it out a little bit more. But luckily enough, I have really great coworkers who are experiencing some very similar things. And a lot of the times, you know, we kind of reflect with each other or, you know, talk about things openly. And we're at the point um, in, you know, our careers and, you know, just what we do of just, you know, saying it and, you know, really honoring saying like, that's really messed up and not saying, well, at least you did this, or at least you did that and trying to make it better and really honing in on like, this is messed up. And, you know, how can I do to support you? In addition to that, we talk about self-care all the time. Sometimes I'm just like, this is disgusting because it's so cheesy, but it's true in the sense that you really have to take care of yourself and fill your batteries up before you can support anybody else. And um, self-care for me is constantly evolving and it always looks different. Uh, I, you know, even though I hated gym at the time, I work out all the time because it really, really helps my mental health. Um, you know, making sure I have things and I'm hanging out with people outside of work and outside of the fields where I'm not Mm. talking about it constantly is super important to me. Again, keeping those boundaries really, really firm. And then also, you know, talking with, my manager with my teammates or with my mentor saying like, this is really, really challenging because of this, this, and this, and I need to talk it out, or I have a really, really difficult case and I don't know how to deal, or, um, I need you to take over because this is too much for me right now. And being really open and, um, asking for the help and the support that you need, which for me is really, really hard yeah. most of the time, because I feel like I, I'm the one who needs to give the support, but at the same time, I can't support a patient or family or support my friends or support my family. If I am not, you know, nourishing myself the way I need to. And I think, you know, we touched on that and I, it, it's so valid to look after yourself, particularly in what you do that is so emotionally taxing. Um, But there's this question that I ask all of my guests and I think it's a really interesting one to ask you but I'm going to do it in two parts what advice would you give your younger self Ooh, that's really hard but I think that the advice I give to my younger self is to make sure to take care of yourself Mm. and to make sure to put yourself first Because if you don't put yourself first, you can't take care of anybody else. And I think to that, I I mean, I completely agree. I think it's, again, you know, it's such a, do you remember when we were in, were we in like the seventh grade or something with this math teacher? And whenever you understood something, she'd say, did you have an aha moment? Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like Mm -hmm. I'm having an aha moment. Um, sort of thinking, oh, you know, how could have I supported you better and mm-hmm. all of that. But, you know, you were, and you know, still are just the absolute best, best friend to me. <laughs> and, you know, I know we've talked about how my experiences, you know, have informed your work and, you know, what you do now, but I can just hand on heart say you know I wouldn't be the person that I am if you hadn't been there for me um and I appreciate 
everything you did so incredibly much. And I think it's also really important and I really hope that, you know, any disabled people who are listening to this share this episode with their non-disabled friends. I want to ask you, what advice would you give to friends of disabled people, you know, and particularly complex needs Mm -hmm. disabled people, you know, and or even just wheelchair users, just sort of the the two Emmas that I was and Mm -hmm. well was, yeah, with you, you know, the one who could just go to the movies with you and then the one who couldn't talk for a year. But, Mm -hmm. you know, what advice would you give to best friends of disabled people? I think that, you know, first of all, really figuring out what that relation, what that relationship means to you. And why are you in this type of relationship with somebody? And once you figure that out, how are you going to create the best experience for both of you in order to live and to be fulfilled in life? So what does that look like? Is that, you know, making sure that we can go to the movies Mm -hmm. and making sure that your dad sits three rows away (laughs) so we can pretend that we're normal kids? Or is it you know, are you the friend that goes to the hospital once a week to make sure that um, your friend is feeling normal and feeling safe, emotionally safe and making jewelry? Or are you the person that's advocating for them to lead as much independence as possible? I completely forgot that we made dad do that. Yes. Or Jeff. Uh-huh. Or Jeff. The um, things that we put that guy through. Kind of. And, um, it's just also reminded me because, you know, you were, you know, a member of my family, essentially. And when you said about when you were a kid and you were obsessed with medicine and stuff, I was talking about this the other day. Um, do uh, You and I were playing doctor with my brother. Oh, my God. He was our patient and we were, Always. you know, we, was do- we were doing stuff and, you know, it was just. <laughs> It's so stupid to so think about stupid. that, but it was so much fun. Um, so fun. But I think that your advice for friends of disabled people is so important. And it's really like something that I was so keen to have you talk about because it is such an interesting relationship. And what I was, you know, I was telling my dad, again, shout out Jeff, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, that we were going to be recording this today and one thing that he mentioned was that you know because you are a friend you know you were doing all of this by choice you know it wasn't oh I happen to have a disabled sibling or I happen to have a disabled child so it's a given that my life is gonna look different you know it was we even you know at five years old chose to be friends with each other and then that shaped our entire lives and you know it's I'm just so pleased that we were able to have this conversation because it's it's taught me a lot and I just really hope that it sheds some light for disabled people and non-disabled people about these types of relationships and teaches people about the importance of inclusion and you know all of the things that we just naturally did um and I just want to wrap up with one particular memory um as as well one that I have of you that I just love to bits um so after I was discharged from hospital with swine flu I couldn't speak for a year um you know but we still hung out every week and everything Mm -hmm. like that and I remember when I was able to start speaking again um you were in the kitchen with my mom getting Chinese on Friday and she I was probably just being a sassy son of a bitch or something and my mom said to you oh Emma's got her sass back and Mm -hmm. you just said I don't think the sass ever left. We just couldn't hear it. 
And I just, you know, again, it's just that how in tune we were with each other and how connected we were and, you know, always have been, I think is so important and it's such a really interesting perspective. And I just really want to thank you so much for sharing all of this with my podcast and for, like I said, help. You know, I know that um, like my experiences have shaped who you are, but like equally you have with me. So without this, maybe the episode where we both cry. But I mean, I'm close to it. I don't know. I know, but just mentalizing my feelings per usual. But exactly. um, But I want to thank you, as you know, that I would not be definitely not the person I am today, but I would not be in the career that I am today where I'm. I feel like I finally, if I really have learned that this is what I was supposed to do. And it's again, as cheesy as that sounds. And I hate myself for saying that because it's like, ugh, gross. But um, if those experiences didn't happen to me, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the lady that I am. So um, as tough as it was, and as much as I never want to experience it again, I'm really, really glad that I did. If someone doesn't call you a cheesy American in the comments, I'm going to be really upset. We'd so upset with them. Yeah. So yeah. someone comment that and <laughs> share this with your non-disabled friends. And just thank you, Lainey, for making the time of the six hour time difference to yeah. talk to us and for being on the wheelchair activist. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Wheelchair Activist, where I talked to the truly incredible Blaine Burke. I really hope that if you're listening to this and you're a disabled person, please share this with your non-disabled friends so that they can gain some perspective and some insight into how other people are found being best friends with a disabled person. I certainly learned so much from talking to Lainey, which is so strange to me given that I have known her for 23 years. Before you go, I just want to remind you that we do have a GoFundMe and a Patreon available to help with funding this amazing podcast. I am currently working with a podcast editor and a podcast producer to help make this podcast as accessible as possible. This involves heavy editing and also making sure that we have a fully captioned version of each and every episode on YouTube so that no one is not able to access this content and the amazing conversations I have with disabled people. If you are able to donate anything to our GoFundMe or to join our Patreon, we would be forever, forever grateful. The ways to do that will be in the description of this episode. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast and for supporting this project. And I can't wait to see you in the next episode.